Welcome to the Real Next webinar. I'm Jeff Finn, CEO of Real Next, and we really appreciate your joining us today for what is going to be an outstanding program on the continuation of our monthly webinar series. Today we have Dr. Glenn Mueller with us who will be presenting uh, his real estate market cycle monitor, which covers and features over 54 markets across the country and where they are in the market cycle and what's driving and, and what we uh, might expect as far as outlooks in each, each of those markets. Uh, Glenn will be presenting for about 45 minutes and we'll um, follow the presentation with Q&A. So use the question box in the go to meeting or go to webinar screen on the right side of the screen type in your questions even along the way and uh, we will do our best to moderate them and cover them at the back end we're also delighted today to have dr jeff fisher who you've heard uh, many times uh, doing our uh, quarterly pricing index and uh, dr fisher will moderate with glenn the presentation introduce him in just uh, a minute and uh, walk through the program with you. So both uh, Jeff, uh, two Jeffs and uh, and Glenn will be on the call to work with you today. And as people are joining, uh, a lot of people still coming into the room, we will just uh, just about ready to, to get started. So wanted to, again, thank you all for joining us. We have a great turnout today. Um, it's gonna be a lot, lot of ground to cover and Real Next as always is delighted to host the group and host this type of educational information information informational session for the the industry it's uh it's very timely as the real estate market hits a, 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 a part of the cycle as it's in today to take a look and to try to look forward to to see where we're at and uh, make some some decisions on, on where to invest and uh, where to possibly buy or, or or sell and how to make your asset management decisions so uh, we're really looking forward to the, the remarks coming in today. Real Next has uh, done a, an incredible amount of work over the past year. And if you haven't seen the Real Next platform lately, you really haven't seen it. We, we've we come out with a, a new release just this uh, first quarter with another uh, update coming out this week, which is a, an incredible addition to what has been a, a, an already robust platform becoming even, even greater than it, it's been in the past, uh, an incredible a CRM platform that's really more than just CRM, but actually is a full asset information management platform to track buildings, tenants, and and all of your prospects and, and deals in the market. An incredible uh, and elegant presentation manager to create uh, customized proposals, BOVs, uh, flyers, brochures, offering memorandums, and uh, deal rooms to sell and, and manage your, your investment uh, sales processes and a, a dynamic marketplace to showcase your listings to to find opportunities to to buy to to promote your properties to sell and to reach out to over a hundred thousand uh, investors active in our community that are looking to, to buy sell and lease property we also have a very uh, powerful yet simple investment analysis engine to do your uh, discounted cash flow analysis as well as your comparative lease analysis so really all in one box the uh, the most powerful solution set in the industry and at uh, an incredibly affordable price we've also developed some great new tools uh, by way of 3d virtual reality that we're really excited about and it's it's very innovative and uh, not everyone's taking advantage of it yet so you might be the first in your market to be able to take advantage of some of these types of tools that help you showcase available space or availabilities uh, that are, are coming to market, whether it's new development or vacant space that's coming online that needs to be re-envisioned and repackaged or, or repurposed. Uh, not everybody's able to take a 2D picture and envision what it could be or a fully demised built out space and figure out what it could be if they re-demised it for themselves. So being able to take a, an existing space and work with your client to in real time, put in walls, put in furniture, manage the workflow and make sure it works for them uh, to give them a full virtual tour, whether they're in the office with you or around the world anywhere and in a collaborative environment with multiple people coming together into a virtual space to, to do a, a tour, uh, we're finding to be a very efficient way to both market space to engage prospects as well as to help them make more efficient decisions at the, the end of the, the process and saving weeks and weeks of time in the decision-making uh, process. So. 
Uh, you can you can find out more about all of the Real Next tools and solutions at any of our websites, therealnext.com or the Real Next Marketplace for our uh, property list and search or uh, the uh, info.realnext.com at 3D uh, VR to find out more about the, the virtual reality solutions. And of course, you can contact any of our, our sales representatives to give you a, a free trial or a demo or to learn more about the product. So enough of the commercial. We really appreciate many of you that are clients of, of Real Next and using some of the tools and we're all of them and others that uh, are interested, uh, please, please uh, contact us and we'll be glad to show you more. So with that, Jeff, let me turn it, the uh, mic over to you and Glenn, the screen over to you and we will get started with the program. Thanks okay. again. Thanks, Jeff. And that, that, as you know, I ordered one of those quick tours for a condo that I have for sale or lease, and the the, the broker really liked it. Put it put it up right away, and the link to it right away on the uh, MLS. So hopefully that'll that'll uh, shorten that that lease or sale time. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Glenn Miller um, on the short bio that uh, was in the the information to uh, let you know about the webinar today. It indicates that. Uh, Glenn has been doing research for 36 years, and I, I think I've known Glenn for uh, uh, most, if not all, of those 36 years. Uh, he's become internationally known for his uh, market cycle research. I think he invented the cycle analysis, and uh, he's presented the uh, information on, on his cycle, uh, I think, at 32 different universities. He's been doing this report since 1992 with over 100 issues of it. Um, and so it's it's really been well accepted in in the industry. Um, he's also a professor at uh, University of Denver. Um, Glenn, thanks for taking time out from from your skiing today to uh, um, to do the webinar. I understand you had some some fresh powder, which you can tell us uh, about when when you get started. Um, but uh, I also mentioned that he's had former research positions with Leg Mason, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Um, ABKB, LaSalle Real Estate Investors, and Prudential Real Estate Investors. So a lot of practical experience in, in addition to uh, being a uh, well-known academic. With that, I will turn it over to Glenn. Okay, great. And uh, can everyone see uh, my screen all right? You're yeah. good. Thanks. Great. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for having me. I'm excited to uh, share some insights with you today. Um, yes, it was a 17 inch powder day here in Colorado this morning. So I was over at Keystone, Avalanche has shut down the highway so you couldn't get to Copper, Vale or Beaver Creek and actually even Arapaho Basin. So uh, I was lucky to be able to get close enough to, uh, to get some of that snow. Um, so uh, what I wanna do today is talk to you about um, really what's driving real estate and where we are in the cycle. And uh, to do that, I'm gonna start with the fact that uh, each of you in your local markets should be watching your demand drivers. Um, the main demand drivers are population growth um, with the US now at um, 330 million people. We're growing at nine tenths of 1%. Which is about 300 million people, which is about 3 million people a year, which is basically a city the size of Denver that we need to build each year to give those people a place to eat, sleep, shop, work, play, pray, store, etc. Um, GDP growth obviously is is the typical item that everyone watches for how the economy is doing. Um, uh, two quarters or more of negative GDP growth is the definition of a recession. Um, since the Great Recession, we've been growing in the two to two and a half percent range each quarter. And people believe that is where the economists are expecting that's going to slow down a little bit here in the near future around 2021 or so. But really, the key thing that you need to watch is employment growth. Uh, employment growth, every time someone's employed, uh, they, they use real estate space. And as you can see here, obviously negative employment growth during the Great Recession. Second quarter of 2010, it turned positive again and has been positive ever since. You note on this graph that it's slowing down, that the forecast is, it for, is, is for it to slow down a little bit. That's not so much because of not having millennials coming in, into the workforce. It's because there's more baby boomers like uh, Jeff and I 
who are coming up to retirement age uh, than there are baby boomers coming in. So um, the forecast is for employment growth to slow to close to zero by 2021 before it turns right back around and picks up. You should be watching the major employers or what we call the economic base employers in your um, in your market because they're the ones that drive demand. And an economic base industry is one that produces a good or service that it exports outside of the local economy that brings uh, brings money and more employment in. Uh, best example is Detroit. Michigan is obviously the auto industry. Uh, Denver, Colorado, we are technology, energy, financial services, um, and then you can watch the major companies. So you should have a handle on that at all times. On the flip side, the two most important uh, factors that we have for cost for owning and operating real estate are inflation. As you know, inflation has been extremely low in the 2% range since the Great Recession. Forecasts are for it to you know, jump up into the 3% range. That continues not to happen. And I think it's one of the reasons potentially that the Federal Reserve is backed off now on potentially trying to raise rates later this year. And then interest rates. Um, if you're doing short-term construction loans, uh, most people use three-month LIBOR, but actually LIBOR is going away in a year or two and we're and the financial industry is looking for a replacement. Um, but the key thing for us in commercial real estate, of course, is uh, maximum 10-year loans. So the 10-year treasury is our best benchmark. Um, it has been running sub 2% literally since 2011. Um, it has uh, bounced up to 3% in kind of 2018. And you see here a forecast saying that it should hit four, but it's actually back down around 2.7 right now. So it did hit three and then moved back down. So we've got low interest rates, which means financing um, uh, is, is not as big a drag on the uh, earnings to equity holders. So here's a graph <coughs> showing you previous expansionary periods and then the recessionary periods in circles. And the one thing you'll notice here over on the right is that this expansionary period that we're in right now um, looks like it's as long or running longer than, than some previous cycles. But the other thing to note is that it is a lower growth rate for both GDP and employment growth. So the potential for it to run longer, I think is much higher. And many economists, that's some of the new mantra out there of lower for longer. And so uh, I hope that's the case. Uh, we, we could literally have this expansion run for many years. The world's longest expansion is, is Australia, and they're currently in their 28th year with no recessions. As a matter of fact, here's a graph showing, and I'm sorry, this looks like it, it uh, is a little uh, 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 funky there, uh, but, um, you know, uh, you know, we're at 120 months right now from, uh, you know, compared to previous uh, expansionary periods, and so we're probably going to have one of the longest expansionary periods since the uh, World War II coming up. So my my real estate market cycle analysis is really broken into two parts. Um, it is basically income and prices. So the three key metrics that we worry about are occupancies and rents, and I use occupancies instead of vacancies, and you'll see why here shortly, and then property prices, which is really affected by capital flows. To me, real estate's just a delayed area of the U.S. economy, and if the U.S. economy is going to expand, so will uh, real estate. So my uh, first half of the cycle analysis is the physical cycle, and it's this simple demand for space, basically employment, and supply of new space, construction being brought online, drive occupancy rates. Occupancy rates in their, in their levels, I'll show you, drive rental growth. And if I add occupancy change plus rent growth together, that drives income in any property. So here's my cycle. It is uh, four phases, a recession expansion, a hypersupply, and a recessionary phase. If you flipped it upside down, it would it would be a vacancy chart. But to me, it's easier to say things are bad and occupancies are low or things are good and occupancies are high. So declining vacancy on the way up from one to 11, increasing or decreasing occupancy on the way down. And of course, new construction in both the expansion and hyper supply phase, little or no new construction in the recovery. And we typically don't start anything in the recession phase, 
but we do uh, take buildings that were under construction and complete them. So uh, here's my theory. Uh, when you're at the bottom, points one, two, and three, uh, you drop prices to get people in the door, so negative rent growth. Above that, you start to get some rent growth, but below inflation. When you hit the long-term average, the gray dotted line, uh, you're at uh, a, a occupancy level that uh, should get rent growth at about the rate of inflation. Above that, rents start to rise rapidly towards cost feasible new construction rents, which is 0.8, which I have in green, and it's this simple. If it costs $400 a square foot to build a new building and investors are looking for a 10% rate of return on their costs, 10% of 400 is, I need $40 a square foot in rent uh, to cost justify building that new building. Of course, above that, um, the rent growth gets even better, uh, mainly because supply is trying to catch up to demand growth. When we get to the peak occupancy level in the market, uniquely, that's really where demand and supply are growing at the exact same rate. Hence, um, it's really economic equilibrium, which seems odd. Most people would think it's along points six and 14. And then one of two things happens. Either we start to grow supply faster than demand, which means occupancy starts to decline, or demand drops off from its moderate level while supply continues at that moderate level. In either case, supply is growing at a faster rate than demand and occupancy start to fall. So rent growth starts to decelerate. We then go back across the long-term average and rent growth goes negative um, or uh, very low. So the study that I published many years ago, um, looking at this, shows that it really does work pretty well. Points one and two, negative rent growth in office. Points three, four, five, positive growth, but below the long-term rate of inflation, which over that time frame had been 4%. Then in the green shaded area is the expansionary period, points six to 11. You see really strong rent growth with the highest rent growth happening at point 10 in the cycle. And then as you hit the peak and you start to look at either demand slowing down because of slowing employment or supply picking up being too high. Um, you see rent growth decelerate back to kind of uh, inflation or a little below at 0.14 and then low and negative at the bottom. So if you knew where your market was in the cycle, that would help you uh, make better investment decisions, better marketing decisions, better rehab decisions, better refinancing decisions and everything else. So each quarter, I cover the 54 largest metropolitan statistical areas or MSAs in the country. And here they are laid out in my cycle graph. Uh, and again, what I do is I actually model each and every one of these 54 markets uh, as to where they sit in the cycle. So it's how much demand and what's it coming from and how much new supply is coming online. So uh, new, uh, new supply in Chicago doesn't affect Milwaukee, which is an hour away. Um, so as you know here, the national average is at 0.8, but we've got markets spread all across the, uh, the spectrum here, if you will, from points five to 11. And then of course, Houston is the one market that's over the top. The reason for Houston being over the top is that it's economic base industry of oil with low gas prices, the oil industry has has laid people off over the past few years, so demand dropped below the rate of new supply. That's the only market that basically has that problem at this point in time. And I've got Denver yellow highlighted just because it's where I'm from and it's easy to watch. And as we go through the different property types, you'll see that things are in different points. So Denver is basically at the same place as the national average. Two other things to note here on the on the uh, graph is that some markets are in bold and italics. When I first started doing this at Prudential years ago, many of my institutional clients would say, this is great stuff, but we only care about the big institutional markets. What I did was I took all these markets, lined them up, looked at the total amount of square footage in each market and look for a, uh, a breaking point. And very interestingly here in, in office, it only takes 11 markets to make up 50% of all the square footage in all 54 of these markets. So you've got some very large markets. And property type by property type, when we get to apartments, it takes 15 markets 
to make up 50% of all the square footage in the same 54 markets. And of course, here you see at point six, Las Vegas is not bold, but it certainly is when we get to hotels. So the, the composition of the large markets can change um, uh, property type by property type. Glenn, so we have see, a lot of users in, in Las Vegas, and as you know, I have a place there, so it looks like right. Las Vegas is in a pretty good spot there at number six. Right, right, just just starting to take off. Of course, Las Vegas doesn't have a lot of um, office using employment, um, but uh, more and more, as especially as you get more retirees there and things like that, um, you know, medical, accounting, legal, et cetera, uh, you know, our office users that where where that demand can start to pick up. So, uh, yeah, it's sitting it's sitting in a good place. It's at its lo historic long term average occupancy level and looks like it'll be moving forward. Moving on to industrial, you can see that pretty much every market in the country is at a peak. Peak occupancy level, mainly because of the demand, two major effects, obviously the Amazon effect, uh, Amazon demanding a lot of new space and pretty much every retailer trying to keep up. So every retailer has got to have an internet presence and then be able to deliver. So they've all got to have warehouse space to be able to do that with. So the demand there has been going up tremendously for the past few years. As a matter of fact, fun factoid, last year, Amazon rented 25% of all new space rented in the United States. That's how much they expanded. Now, so Glenn, it, it sort of looks like it's peaked, but we, we don't know how long it will be until it goes from 11 to 12, right? I mean, I know the institutional right. investors think that uh, industrial has at least another year to run in terms of being the best performing property type. Right. And actually, I'm going to hold on that question, Jeff, because okay. I'm going to get to that exact thing when I go into my go into my forecast. So okay. right now yeah. I'm going through where we are and then I'm going to talk through how we actually forecast where we're going. OK, so um, here uh, the, the other reason for all the for, for the demand is that we just have more stuff. Um, we just have more SKUs, more products of every shape and size, and we need to store all that extra stuff so there's more options for people. Note that Denver is over the top, and that's a quick, fun little story. Denver got a new economic base industry five years ago, legalizing marijuana. The demand for all warehouse space went up tremendously because they grow inside under lights, and um, rents went from three bucks to six bucks a square foot. Cost feasible is four, so when you've got a really profitable thing, what do you do? You build spec space to get to get it rented out. So we're actually overbuilding the Denver uh, warehouse uh, right now because because of that uh, you know, new economic base demand driver. If we look at apartments, it's the one property type that's easy to finance because the government agencies, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae, will finance apartments as well as homes, and so. Um, Everybody sees de demand from millennials, and there's great demand. There's at least a five-year run going here. Um, but in a lot of markets, we're putting up too much. Hence, we're seeing rent growth decelerating, people offering um, concessions, and that type of stuff uh, in, the, uh, in the marketplace. Retail is probably the biggest surprise for you. Most of the markets are at a peak occupancy in retail. Uh, and the main reason for that is we have almost no new space being constructed, but we're also taking space off the market. We're converting some old retail into apartments or into warehouse space for Amazon. Um, we are reconfiguring when Sears goes out of business. If it's a if it's a reasonably decent mall, the mall owner is very happy because they're going to be able to rent at inline uh, tenant space instead of anchor tenant rents, which uh, historically have been much lower as, you know, as much as a, uh, a quarter to a third of what inline tenants have to pay. And then finally, hotels. You can see that uh, hotel markets, uh, a lot of them are at a peak, um, and uh, uh, but there's some markets that are over the top where um, with high occupancies, there's high profits. And if you've got a high profit, you think you really know what you're doing. So what do you do? You build more hotels. So that's where we are at the moment. But now let's turn to thinking about where we're going and what's going on. My hope today is to make all of you sort of students of the economy and students of watching macro trends that might be affect what's affecting what's going on. So I'm gonna step back through my 40 years in real estate and look at uh, and talk about what happened to office. 
So in the 1970s, you can see here that um, demand, the yellow bar, was growing in the first half of that decade at around 2% average, whereas supply was growing at five. Hence, we had a down cycle, uh, including a recession in 1974. Uh, and then beginning in 1976, all these baby boomers like me were going to work and we had demand growing at a faster rate than supply, hence an up cycle to actually a peak occupancy in 1979 of 95%. A 5% vacancy rate is real low, as you all know, okay? Then the 1980s comes along and um, the Tax Act of 81 uh, allows for building buildings that, that aren't leased because the tax shelter um, was worth it. And you can see here that the average for the entire decade was a 7.7% per year growth. If you compounded that uh, over that decade, we more than doubled the amount of office space in the United States in one decade. And 80% of this new construction was in suburban office space. So that's pretty incredible. Um, the, but the most amazing thing actually on this graph is the rate of demand growth. Demand grew at 3.8% a year. And you say, why is that um, incredible when supply was growing at 7.7? Answer is this, population was growing at one, employment growth was growing at 1.4% because of baby boomers like me going to work. So 3.8% is triple the rate of employment growth overall. And the reason is very simple. The economic base of the United States as a whole changed. In 1960, 30% of all people were in manufacturing industry. Today, it's 8%. In 1960, 8% of all people were in office using jobs. Today, it's over 30%. So we were going through this change where the demand for office was going up because we were switching out of manufacturing into office using jobs. So next uh, uh, decade, the 1990s, you can see here that um, uh, every year demand was higher than supply. And we absorbed a lot of the oversupply of the 80s. Um, construction was very low uh, in the half percent range from 92 to 95. And then finally, we had a nice equilibrium matchup in uh, 1998 and 1999. We also brought on a lot of researchers during that decade, like Jeff Fisher and myself, who started gathering data, looking at things and talking about what was going on. So instead of everything just being developer driven, we now had researchers looking at what was really happening in the marketplace. 2000s, you can see a real cycle going on here. Uh, drop in demand for the first time in 2001 with the technology bubble bursting, a very quick recovery to peak growth in 2005 and six, slowing to again negative in 2009. And you can see supply kind of trailing behind by about two to three years over what's happening in, uh, you know, in, uh, on the demand side. We also got access to the public capital markets for the first time, um, real big access. Uh, equity through publicly traded REITs and debt through CMBS, commercial mortgage-backed securities. So more with the public markets, more and more data became available uh, as well. Finally, uh, today's decade, you can see that demand has been rising above supply at a pretty slow rate though, just a little over 1%, but we haven't built a lot of new stuff in this decade. And so um, we will see whether or not we can kind of maintain a nice equilibrium. Uh, 2019 and 2020 at the moment look like a little more supply than demand going on, but a uh, fairly small amount. So remember I said that uh, right now the forecast is for employment growth running, you know, in the 2% range or so going forward. Here's the percentage growth of the different property types over time. And what you see is in the forecast here, all of those property types are running uh, below the 2% number today, except for apartments where we are hyper supplying. That's good news that we're actually supposedly matching up demand and supply. So now to start answering the question that Jeff gave before, here is the occupancy level in blue 
You can see the peak back in, uh, in uh, 1980, bottom in 1991, <clears throat> a peak in 2000 with the technology boom, bottom 03 when that technology bubble burst, uh, lower level of high in 2006 uh, and 7 to a bottom in 2010. And today, you know, beginning in 2016, we got occupancy average back up to 90%. And it's been hanging there for the last two years. And my forecast is that continues. So we've got this low equilibrium going on uh, as we go along. Now, here's why I use occupancy instead of vacancy. You can see just visually that the correlation between occupancy growth or occupancy change and rent growth is very high. The, that correlation is actually 79%. So if occupancies are rising, rents are going to rise. If occupancy starts to drop, rents uh, start to drop as well. So, you know, we're looking at a moderate kind of 2 to 3% rent growth for the next few years, which is should be at inflation or so with occupancies hanging in there. So my forecast is that, again, pretty much every market in the country uh, will be in the growth phase. Uh, I just came Monday from teaching at Harvard. That's why you see Boston yellow highlighted here. Denver, move, you know, D Denver by the end of the year, I be believe, will be at 0.9. Notice that Austin moved over the top. Reason for that is Austin has been one of the hottest employment markets in the country with technology and other things. Young people want to live there, so companies are opening up. So we got a lot of new construction there. So they're just slightly oversupplying Austin with office space. Okay, next let's move to industrial. You can see two different periods, same cycle. You can see two different periods of equilibrium, and I believe that we've got another two to three, maybe even four years of really strong occupancy in industrial. It's the one property type that you don't typically build a lot of spec space on because if someone needs it, you can put it up in nine months and the uh, industrial um, uh, parks that are out there have the space to be able to make that happen quickly. So you typically don't see a lot of speculative industrial space being built. I do think that we will see rents, rent growth start to kind of slowly move its way back down to a little bit above inflation from the high 7% we've seen in the last year or two. Um, and so again, pretty much every market at the top, a few markets over the, you know, uh, at peak, uh, a few markets, uh, a few more markets moving over the top where we've got some new construction coming in. Uh, and again, mostly out uh, or, you know, in, in the West. Um, apartments, here you can clearly see the, the real peak in 2014, kind of hung in there a little bit, a little bit lower by 2016, but occupancies are really dropped off here uh, into 2018, and uh, rent growth has dropped from a 6% peak, and right now we're looking at 2% uh, moving its way down to you know, between 1% and 2% rent growth here over the next few years. And then apartments, pretty much the same picture as where, where we were at the end of the year, uh, a number of markets uh, in the hyper supply phase. Retail, and this is kind of interesting, and I don't know if you can see my uh, pointer arrow. Can you see that pointer arrow, Jeff? Yes. If you're on yep. there? Yeah, we can see it. Jeff or Jeff? Yeah, okay. So 1986, we had a peak of about 94%. 2000, we were at 94 and a half. Same thing in 2006. This time we're at a peak occupancy level of 95 and a half. It's the highest that we've ever seen. And that's again because of a uh, moderate amount of new demand. And there is new demand. You know that Amazon is opening 250 uh, Amazon grab and go stores with no cashiers this year. Um, there are a number of other, Aldi is expanding by 150 stores. So there is expansion going on. There's a lot of replacement happening as well, but the amount of new supply is uh, very, very low uh, going forward. However, rent growth also, I believe, is gonna be below 2%, hence not even needing inflation as we go forward, okay? So here's the retail market, and again, pretty much everybody uh, near, the, near the peak. And then here's the hotel cycle. Uh, and you can see that again, we're at the highest ever occupancy level at 72% in hotels that we hit back in 2016.
that is now starting to slow down uh, a little bit. But basically, long-term average for hotels has been around 65%, and you're actually making money above 63. So anytime you're above that, I would expect to see new hotels coming online. And again, almost half and half in the growth phase and the hyper supply phase for hotels. So um, that is the physical cycle. It is, ex it is exactly low in nature. And we look at occupancy levels based on demand and supply to drive rent growth. So we now have talked about the income side of real estate. And I believe that we're gonna see income growth um, in all the property types in 2019 and probably in 2020. And Jeff can either kind of corroborate that with what he's seen with the NACREF index institutional numbers as well. But I think we've got yet a number of years to go unless some black swan event pushes us into a recession that uh, I don't think many economists are predicting now until, uh, you know, I hear 2022, 2023 type of thing. But now let's flip over and talk about prices. I believe that it is capital flows that drive prices for real estate. Just like the stock market, if people think that uh, things are gonna move up, they, they buy stocks driving the prices up. When they're worried about the economy, they pull their money out of the stock market, stick them into bonds, making bond prices go up and bond yields come down. So if we look at, you know, the historic property cycle here in the blue line and, and what should happen theoretically is the capital flow line in black, which is, um, you know, people buying properties in the green shaded area. So if you buy a property from me for a higher price than I paid, more money just flowed in, okay? That starts kind of slow. It's a flat line at the bottom, picks up, gets to its highest rate of growth, the most vertical line area through cost feasible rents, and then really stops in the hyper supply phase because as uh, it looks like occupancies are about to drop, that means people are forecasting declining um, incomes, hence, um, you know, buyer and seller aren't going to get together. Okay. But also, you also have a different capital flow, capital flow to new construction across the bottom there, which should start at that cost feasible rent level, 0.8. Um, and that doesn't stop till the bottom because if I started a building at the peak, I may not finish it until I'm in the hyper supply phase. So, to me, real estate is a separate asset class. Um, you know, based on the value of the bond market and the stock market, um, and then U.S. income producing real estate. I didn't use the word commercial because income producing includes apartments. This doesn't include home ownership though. You know, it's about 22% of the investable universe. Uh, so it's a big asset class and a lot of investors uh, invest in it, okay? Today, if we look at, um, uh, our alternatives, if we look at the bond market, um, here is here is the history of yields on the 10-year treasury, which again is our uh, risk-free benchmark rate um, and the rate that most people are going to look at um, when they're looking at any other corporate bond or municipal bond or anything else. So fun little story to tell here. When I turned 60 a couple of years ago, um, I had a... Um, uh, investment advisor call me because my retirement money from my time at Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and University of Denver are all with TIAA, that's Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association. It's the largest public retirement fund in the country that basically a lot of university and private schools and, you know, it it's focuses on teachers is, is the easy way to put it. So I get this young guy who comes in to talk to me. And he says, Dr. Miller, normally, you know, uh, people assume a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. But as you as you turn 60 and look at retirement, we recommend switching to more 60% fixed income and 40% stocks. And I always have my computer, so I pulled up this graph. And I look at him and I ask him how old he is. Turns out he's a year younger than my son. So I say, okay, dude, let me show you this. So I pull up this graph 
And I say, so somebody back at, at the office is using standard financial theory, which basically says take 30 years worth of history and use that return as what should probably be happening over the next 30 years. And I said, the problem with that is if we look back over the last 30 years, the average yield on 10-year treasuries has been about 5.8%, but the average total return on treasuries between 1981 and 2017 up here on the right has been 8.4%. How can it be higher? And he goes, well, that's very simple. That's because as interest rates go down, bond values rise. I said, correct, you get an A for that answer. I said, so can that be repeated over the next 30 years? Or is it gonna look like when I was born and from 1953 to 1973, when rates went from 2% to the long-term average of 5.8, the total return was only 1.9 because as interest rates go up, bond values drop. And between 1953 and 1981, when they peaked at 15%, interest rates, uh, the total return on bonds was only 3.8%. If you put that low expected return on my bonds, if inflation goes up, I'm, I'm losing money. He said, well, what are you going to do for fixed income? I said, well, Tia Kreft's got a direct real estate fund. I'm going to go zero bonds, 60% direct real estate. And the direct real estate fund at Tia Kref is actually one of the is one is one of the entities that puts it into the NACREF index that uh, Jeff manages. So this is a great slide to show people when you're trying to convince them that they should be investing more in income producing real estate. Um, getting a hold of transaction data in real estate has historically been very hard. Um, longtime friend of mine, uh, Bob White, started a company back in the year 2000 called Real Capital Analytics. They collect data on every single real estate transaction, over $2.5 million in the United States, income producing. So here, quarter by quarter, you can see in 2001, $20 billion of transactions. In 2007, 160. In 2009, Great Recession, um, down to 15 billion. In 2015, back to 160 billion. And then the gray line is their commercial property price index. Most of you have probably seen the Case-Shiller Home Price Index that comes in the papers a lot. This is basically the same thing. And so you can see prices peaking in 2007, dropping uh, into 2009, turning around and recovering to higher numbers. If I break that down by property type, what you see here is that um, today, all commercial properties are 23% higher than their peak values in 2007. Apartments are 62% higher. Retail is 4% below its previous peak. Industrial 16% higher. CBD office 29% higher. And suburban office um, only 2% higher. So property type makes a difference. And obviously city makes a difference as well. Um, you all know that we express our uh, transactions in terms of cap rates. In terms of cap rates. And uh, you can see here that cap rates back in 1990 were running around 8.5%. They, uh, when, when we had the recession in the early 90s, uh, prices dropped and cap rates rose to pretty close to 10. Uh, that first part, uh, most of the 90s, uh, we saw a lot of capital flowing in because REITs were going public, taking that stock money they raised and buying properties, driving prices up. Starting in 1998, you all know that the markets weren't bad but um, a lot of people are pulling their money out of REITs, putting it into tech stocks, hence REIT stock prices dropped. They weren't big buyers, so prices declined and cap rates rose. As soon as the um, technology bubble burst, everybody said, give me a hard asset that doesn't vanish into cyberspace, and real estate became a attractive investment again driving prices up and cap rates down into the 6% range by 07. Recession hits, nobody's buying, prices drop, cap rates bounce right back up to 8%. Recession ends, money flows in, prices go up, cap rates drop back down right into the 6% range. So when you look at this, if you're showing this to a client, they're going, well, why would I buy real estate when it's really expensive? And the answer is this simple. We are in a different 
economy and a different environment today. We're in a low interest rate, low yield environment. The S&P 500 has a dividend yield today of about 1.6%. Ten-year treasuries, our benchmark, are at 2.6%. How much extra yield do you get over that risk-free rate of the 10-year treasury for investing in real estate? Answer, back in 2001, you got 375 basis points. In 07, you were only getting 150. Today, you're getting somewhere between 275 and 600, and for office, industrial, and retail, same 375 you got back in 2001. So you're being well rewarded, rewarded for, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of yield for the real estate that you are buying. Okay, so. This was so popular uh, and, and so well received. And by the way, I, I implore you that if you ever get a call from somebody from Real Capital Analytics trying to confirm a property sale, please give them the information so that they've got good data to share with everybody. Um, in my four decades in this business, first decade, the 70s, local buyer, local seller, local bank doing the financing, 1980s, all of a sudden we expand, we get national buyers, national sellers, and national financing. 1990s, as I said before, public equity from REITs, public debt from CMBS. Since 2000, the world's gone global, and now we get global buyers. Today, mainly in, uh, you know, in the top cities, in the top 10, 12 cities, but expanding into more and more markets as we go along. So real capital analytics, started collecting data on uh, capital flows around the world. And you can see the blue number, the blue lines are US money going to other places and other colors are money coming back to the United States. So top was United States investing in Germany, $10 billion, a 53% increase over the previous year. Next, US into Spain, a huge increase, 433%, because Spain had figured out their economic problems and therefore investors are willing to move back in. Let's look down to number six here. Um, the most money coming in the United States was Singapore in the United States, $6.4 billion, a 96% increase. Fun little story for me to tell here is um, my company, Black Creek Group, we built a, a non-traded industrial REIT. We raised a billion and a half dollars. We bought $3.3 billion worth of properties. In 2017, we sold it to a Singapore REIT for $4.4 billion, hence 4.4 of that 6.4 is my company, Black Creek. China, you see the number going down. That's because of the trade tariffs that were being put in place and Chinese government saying, you may not take your money and, and invest it in the United States. Um, so uh, interesting to see that going on. One of the main reasons I, I bring this up is, is the following. Today, the most expensive property in the United States is, is an office building in New York. Uh, a class A office building in New York will go for a four cap. There will be 20 bidders on that. 10 of them will be um, international. The cap rate on a class A office building in London is two. Hence, our US building looks like a 50% off deal. The cap rate in Japan on a class A office in Tokyo, 1%. Hence, it looks like a 75% off deal. So international capital, I believe, will help to support U.S. real estate prices. So I don't know if you noticed, but my cycle charts have 17 uh, points on them, kind of correlating to the 17-year cycles. Here you can find this on the NAREIT website. Uh, they believe cycles are that long, 72 to 89, a 17-year cycle. Average uh, return, 13.9 per year. 80, uh, 89 to 07 cycle, 17 and a half years, a 14.3% uh, average return. Now, um, here in this latest cycle um, from 2007, we got the Great Recession really dragging the average down. We're only at 4.4%, but we're a little better than halfway through a real estate cycle from that standpoint. Okay, so my conclusions. Real, economic and real estate cycles can be long or short. I believe that we're in a long cycle and in an up cycle right now. 
Uh, cyclones can be driven by demand or supply. You need to watch that in your city very carefully. Supply growth is a, was the slowest it had ever been since 2013, and it's a moderate increase today. So I think we're in the growth phase, started in 2014, and I think we continue to in that phase at, into 2021 at this point. Um, and the financial cycle, capital flows affect prices. You know, we've had a very volatile stock market making people nervous. We've got very, very low bond yield rates, high prices in, so in, in both those markets. So real estate looks like a more stable and safer investment. Debt financing, as I'm sure you all know, has been harder in this cycle. Instead of 75% loan to value, your max is now 60. So more cash down means less speculation. And I think that's actually been working well. So this low new construction, um, I, I think also helps our financial cycle. And then finally at the bottom there you see, make sure you differentiate between residential home ownership People keep asking me to do my cycle work on that. And I say, but my cycle work is occupancies and rents and homes don't have that. That's a production process. Take raw materials, build a house. I don't make a dime until I sell that house. It's just like an auto, it's just like auto manufacturing. So I don't really, um, you know, deal in that at all. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Great, great job, Glenn. I was re reminded by somebody on CNBC today that uh, cyclists don't die of old age, just you know some unexpected event. So right. it sounds like you're you're agreeing that just because it's a uh, been a long cycle doesn't mean it's going to end in the near future. That's correct. Jeff, did we get any questions? Uh, I guess the the main questions are around uh, the cap rates and when and if the you see changes in cap rates and do they are they mitigated by rental growth how right. do you see, where do you see the balance okay well i think uh, jeff has done uh, research there as well as i have over time uh, what research has shown is when interest rates move slowly the correlation with cap rates is very low so if we get very moderate increases in interest rates cap rates typically aren't affected very much um, the demand is so strong. I believe we're going to be in a low interest rate environment for a pretty long time. And I'm I'm going to say that anything past five years is just, you know, a total guess. But I believe that we we will probably be in a low interest rate environment. And I'm going to say sub 4% is my guess, uh, you know, for the next five years. Hence, I believe that cap rates can stay where they are, potentially even edge just a little bit lower and depending upon demand like last year you know based on uh NACREF data and other stuff um you know cap rates for uh industrial because it's the most popular property type have come down retail has gone up because people are like you know i don't you know it doesn't look like it's going to do well so i'm not buying so you know i still think it's a demand supply thing that's going to drive uh cap rates and i believe that they could hang in where they are maybe edge up a little bit, but uh, I, I don't see that happening in the next four or five years. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, and I, I would add that um, if, if any increase in interest rates is accompanied by an increase in inflation, which the Fed would like to see a little bit, um, you know, those tend to be offsetting factors, right? Because you have more rent growth and you have um, construction costs going up with inflation and inflation has always tended to be good for real estate. And the cap right. rate is like the rate of return investors want uh, minus your expected growth. And so uh, with interest rates going up, the rate of return investors want may go up, but their expected growth is also going to go up. So they kind of offset each other. So I, I agree with you. I don't I don't see a one for one increase in cap rates with, with any increase in interest rates. Right. Great. Yeah. As a matter of fact, one of the things I do when people are trying to argue on that point is to say, OK, what does it take to have interest rates go up? And everybody says, well, an improving economy. I said, okay, if the economy is improving, that means more employment, right? I said, yep, that means more demand for real estate. Yep, that means rent increases, right? Yep. So, and historically, you know, using NACREF data, I've done many studies proving that, you know, the, the rate of growth in occupancies and rents has historically always been higher than inflation, you know, during an expanding economy. So, um, it, it's, it, it, it's worked in the past. 
Yeah, I remember our friend uh, Charlie Wurzbach doing a study that found that um, the only time real estate wasn't a good inflation hedge was when the uh, occupancy was really low, and that's that's certainly not what we have right now. Right. Yep. Yeah, that was when I, that was the first study I did with Charlie when I arrived at Prudential in 1990. So it's a little bit different, a little bit um, of the political environment, and they're the black swan the type of scenario they talked about. How how do trade tariffs and some of these other um, political events impact? And what what are you seeing as far as tariffs and trade? Uh, how they'll impact capital markets and the flow of capital and, and values in real estate. Right. Uh, well, I'll say, first of all, I'm actually not an economist. My PhD is actually in real estate. So I use economic information to help me model real estate things. Um, I, I don't know whether, you know, there's so many variables involved in this, you know, uh, whether or not trade tariffs um, slow our economy, um, or not, uh, and those types of things, uh, and whether or not that is about to change, because supposedly you're, you know Trump is talking to China now again. So um, the, the, those things are really hard. They they potentially become black swan events if they're if they're done in a in a in a major way. But um, you know the rest of the world is maybe the, the rest of the world their growth rates are, and I'm going to use a term here. I hope everybody catches decelerating because when you say you know dropping or sl slowing down everybody goes oh here we go and you say no 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 the economy is moving forward years ago we used to we used to run at rates of 40 to 60 miles an hour today we're running in the 20 to 30 mile an hour range and we're going to slow from 30 to 20. we're still making progress and at that slower rate we get better gas mileage so we can last longer that's a good way to i think kind of explain that um, you know this lower for longer economy, um, I think has a pretty high probability to it. There was a question, and I I may have missed it as well. You, you the the bolded markets were the major markets. What were the italicized MSAs? The, well, they're the they're both bold and italics. Okay, so they were the same. Okay, so right, yeah, it, it was yeah. bold. It was italics, and those are the top. Right. And, and when, if you look at the report uh, on the bottom, it gives a little, you know, three sentence yep. ex explanation of that. But so you know, apartments, there are 15 markets that make up 50 percent of all the square footage in the 54 markets that I cover. In office, it's 11. In industrial, I think it's 12. So it's it's somewhere between, you know, 10 and 15, depending upon the property type. And what, what is your, your view as far as the, the outlook on the hotel market? Is it? Uh, at a, a trough or uh, has, has uh, the building slowed down now to start to? De demand, is, de if the economy is still doing well, demand's at a peak. Part of it is millennials like experiences more than things. My three sons travel way more than I did. And um, so, like I said, we're seeing the highest occupancy rate in hotels, nation average, that we've ever seen. They used to run in the 65, 66% range. It's currently 72%, which is unbelievable. And Airbnb is, you know, it, you know, is probably keeping it from going even higher. There's a couple of questions about Canada. I don't know if you have any perspective of, uh, on Canada or any resources that you know that uh, someone could look to to find similar type of research. Right. Um, I do not. Um, but I, I will be I've got one of my former students who's now the CEO of a Canadian REIT uh, coming to ski with me next week. And I'll ask him and get back to you. Um, I, don't, I, I, I would assume that some of the big brokerage houses like CBRE uh, may have data or Jones Lang LaSalle may have data on Canada. Just trying to think of uh, things. It looks like a lot of the questions were were covered in other ways. So we are running at the, the top of the hour, and I will wrap it up with with that. Uh, you guys, you did a great job. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks, Jeff, for moderating. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We really appreciate your participation. Appreciate your your support and the the great insight into the markets. And and glad to hear we've got some room to run in this market. And uh, I think that longer uh, longer, uh, slower for longer, 
type of theme. Right. It's a great one. And, so. Right. And the cycle report, uh, you know, is available to you through RealNex. Um, so, um, you know, your uh, your members are you know welcome to get a hold of the cycle report. I appreciate it. We'll be writing up a summary for everybody, posting that with a link to both the video recording of the session as well as a uh, ability to download the deck. So thanks for making that available, Glenn, and, and thank you for your time and support. Uh, we again appreciate it. Hope you all have a great afternoon. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.